time on you today. We appreciate you coming. First, a few announcements. Uh, our new newsletter will go out in the middle of June. If you have not paid dues and you're not a member of the Historic Fund, it's $15 to $200, and we welcome everything we get because that's the kind of thing to fund what we do. Members. Uh, another thing we'll put out, we just recently had an upgrade or an add-on to our members on Friday, Emerging Voices of Crawford County 50th anniversary. And I don't have the URL with me, but I will post it on our Facebook page. It is a tour of 21 sites in Crawford County that were relative to the history of school integration in Crawford County. It's uh, video clips. or something. <laughs> they invented it during World War II to absorb grease and fuels and stuff in air base. That's why you have kitty litter. We have a whole display out there of things that they invented in World War II, not besides smart missiles and all that that we use in our daily life. Yeah, we use sand on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, our next exhibit is going to be our help Doctor to technology. And I got really blessed because when I got that idea, two days later, Walter did this from Coffee Regional Medical Center brought me every old crap since 1954. So I was ecstatic and I've got pictures and maps and things. So I'm just real thrilled about that. More so than I am World War II, but I've done this. We'll be here next month. Dr. Jim Cottingham will speak in June, and you're in for a real treat because I'm going to be speaking in July. <laughs> and in August, our friend behind the camera is going to be in front of the camera. All right. So we're looking forward to all of that, and we hope y'all continue to come. We will feed you. I promise you every time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce somebody I went to high school with. It was older than I was. <laughs> But I've known him a long time. I've known his family. Mama Lou was my grandma's best friend. So I mean, I have known that crowd a long time. I liked his wife before I knew him. So that to be Mr. Jimmy Dodd. Uh, thank you, Carol. I say, when I walked in before you folks got here, one fella already started reminiscing. <laughs> He saw this large photo down here. He said, "Isn't that where I used to ride horses across that across that pond over there with the page boys?" I said, "Yes, sir." <laughs> so he uh, spent time on our phone. But here, uh, I'm glad to be here with the retired educator today. I'm sorry my wife is here because she's still able to work. And I don't know why she didn't hold her, keep holding her job down because you know it would have helped out with the growth. <laughs> And I see a lot of people here that I knew when I was when I was uh, young uh, and went to school with Curtis Farrell. He was old. He was a bit, he was way ahead of me in the school. And James Dennis was uh, way behind me, one, one grade. <laughs> but uh, I never knew James till I came to Douglas. And uh, I don't know if I'll remember to tell you that or not. But there were seven kids in my family. And we all went to high school in Broxton. And I think I'm the only one. Well, my younger sister. Uh, my next uh, sister up, uh, and I only ones who went to the 12th grade. The rest of them went to the 11th grade, all they had. And I had one sister, she was so smart, she left in the 10th grade and went to college. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm here to tell you about how the doctors got to. Uh, 
Coffee County. One more thing about teaching since we've got teachers here. Uh, who's got the longest tenure without going around the row room of teaching here? Anybody got 45 years? 45 years? Okay. Well, my sister put you all to shame, but it got the best of her. My oldest sister, Betty, taught for 50 years. Taught for 50 years, but it killed her. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was still teaching and just dropped dead one night. So, uh, anyway, we got educators in our family also. But I'm here today to tell you how the doctors got to Coffee County. And uh, eventually we ended up here. You see in these photos, not this one. This is where my father was born, up in Union County, such as Georgia, out in a valley uh, near uh, Lake Winfield Scott. But um, these are volumes of the Doctrines of Dixie. They're basically the same. This later volume here, the second edition, is just an update uh, of this. But there are a lot of research went into this to trace down kinfolk after kinfolk after kinfolk. And my brother, oldest brother, uh, who's deceased, there's three of us left and two of us here today. Uh, my, old, my old sister Faye, and she was, uh, oh Lord, she's born 12 years before I. Uh, and then I have an older sister in uh, Poland. Not over there in Europe now. Poland, the other side of Tai Tai in Poland, Georgia. And she is, uh, she is the fourth child. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Billy, Betty, Bo, Bobby. Yeah, she's the fourth child. No, she's the fourth. You're the fifth. Okay. But, uh, but she's 91 and rolling. Boy, she plants her own garden, picks up all her pecans, works at the church, uh, steady on the road visiting grandchildren and what have you. But this book was, uh, you're welcome to look at it, but there's not a whole lot. There's a few pictures, but it's mostly just genealogy and information after information after information. And my brother worked ex extensively with the author of this book, uh, uh, Brother William G. Bill Allen, uh, who his, his mother was of the Dockery lineage. And uh, it's just full of history of the Dockeries, and there were, he follows about, oh, four or five trails of Dockeries that were mainly brothers, and, uh, and where they dispersed, they started out. But the Dockeries go way, way back. Uh, the Dockeries of Dixie, uh, this book can, is about some 24,000 about some 24,000 cousins and their connecting families, their birth, life, death, courtship, love, marriage, children, schooling, work, and their contribution to humanity. And it gives you that information about each one in this book. Some of them are short, some of them are longer. And, uh, but it's just a lot of more information than, than you can really fathom. If you, all the things I do with it, just look to see who my cousin is, excuse me, my cousin or my uncle, or my aunt, or my grandparents, this, that, and the other. Um, but the origin of the Dockery name, uh, they traced it all the way back. It was acquired from once living in the several places in England. Spelled spelled Dockra, spelled a different name, D-O-C-H-R-A, in 1195. So they traced the family back to 1195. Uh, uh, and then Dockra, D-O-C-W-R-A, in 1292. And now Dockra, D-O-C-K-R-A-Y, uh, four places along the... Uh, the um, County Cumberland along the uh, Anglo-Scottish uh, border is where the doctors lived in England and, and Scotland over there. Records exist in England of John of John Dockery in 1332 and Robert Dockery in 1467. First U.S. 
U.S. Census reveals uh, in, in, in uh, the first U.S. Census in the U.S. of 1790 lists families of doctors in North Carolina and Rhode Island. Our oldest known and our oldest known uh, proven ancestor. This is the only one they could prove now. We didn't, they didn't go all the way back in England and try and see if we had any royal blood. We, uh, nowhere, did, nowhere did they find that we were in the line of secession to the throne. So we don't have any royal blood. And if you saw a lot of my kin folks, you would understand why. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the oldest known proven ancestor now that, that Adam was able to find in his helpers. And what he would do is would get ask people in each different families to give them what information they could gather. And I can remember riding with my brother all through the mountains of North Georgia and all down here in South Georgia and walking through cemetery after cemetery after cemetery. And if you found a doctor, you hollered. <laughs> and uh, he would, he would uh, make a record of their of what was on their tombstone. And that's how a lot of this information got here. And uh, he, my oldest brother, Bill, was a, he was, oh, he loved genealogy. And his, uh, he died at 85, but he, uh, he had his computer. It, if he had one, if he didn't, if he had uh, probably nothing else on, because it would have been overloaded. It would have blown a fuse today, because he had thousands and thousands of names in his computer at home that he just kept up with. And he was real proud of that, which uh, is something to be proud of. Out of when you spend that much time tracing your family roots. Uh, but the oldest known ancestor is James William Dockery Sr. Uh, he lived from 1768 to 1855 and a census in North Carolina shows in, in 1790 shows this, uh, a record of James William Dockery. The uh, the, the, the Dockers kind of, the, my, my group of Dockers kind of were in southern, southern North Carolina, uh, up around Murphy and a little north there between Murphy and Asheville, North Carolina in the beginning. And um, the Cherokee, and the, that was all Indian nation back then. The Cherokee Indians were all over North Georgia and uh, North Carolina. And in 1843, with the removal uh, of, of the Indians, you know, they, they shipped, they rounded all the Indians up and sent them to where? Oklahoma. They sent the Cherokee Nation to Oklahoma. And, uh, and you've heard of the Trail of Tears, and that's, uh, that's what that was all about, was sending the Indians away from their native land and taking over. And when the Indians moved out, the government provided land grants and the Dockers moved in. And they, uh, they, uh, they settled around the, the Flat Creek Church and the Hanging Dog Church area of North Carolina in 1843, according to church records uh, at Hanging Dog uh, Baptist Church. We'll talk more about hanging dog later. But, uh, the Dockers um, were typical pioneers in the early 1850s. Uh, Thomas Dockery, he, that was my great, great grandfather, yeah, great, great grandfather. And many of his descendants moved to Union County, Georgia. Now, I don't know how many of you know where Union County is, or Blairsville. Blairsville is the county seat. That's up Highway 19, and Blair is the last stop before you go into North Carolina. But, uh, but they moved into that area south of Blairsville, uh, the valley there where such a Georgia is located. A little, uh, just a little community about the size of, I guess back in the heyday, about the size of Prison or West Green. <laughs> but uh, it's well known, you can mention such as to that folks know about the mountains. They say, oh yeah, and they still still uh, go by such as. In fact, this photo here is a house 
in, in downtown such as <laughs> where, my, where my father was born in 1902. Yeah, 1902, my father was born there. And that was a pretty good house for, for 1902. It was built in the 1800s by my grandfather. Uh, so um, he, he was born there along with three or four sisters. And we'd get... We'll get a little more into that and the family connection there. But many of the sons moved to Union County, as I said, and other families moved to Tennessee, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Mississippi. I always had to be flipping a channel one night, and I saw a special on these big plantation owners in Mississippi, and they were dockers. I said, Lord, that ain't none of our crowd. <laughs> so they, they, they owned thousands of acres in Mississippi. But, uh, so, but, so we got scattered around. And... Uh, there's Dockers in Texas. In fact, uh, I was watching a Texas football game on college several years ago. Big old boy, big old boy, uh, big big black black tackle uh, on playing for Texas. Across the back of his jersey, it read Docker. I said, "Well, that's some of my kin folks playing football." <laughs> so you know, back then, a lot of a lot of the former slaves uh, of of the time took the name. Of, of their owners but um, in fact my, my father never owned any slaves uh, he did have seven but we finally all graduated from high school and got on out of there but <laughs> that's the only slaves he had was seven slaves he had tenant farmers and, and seven slaves but uh, we all we, we broke the chains and left so so um, Anyway, uh, the doctor lineage also made a significant impact upon the population of Coffee County, Georgia, where many descendants of Noah Dockery, that's my great-grandfather, reside today. And I being one of those, and, and my sister, and uh, anybody's name that you run across, the name Dockery is related. We were a cousin, I don't know how far removed, and there was a lot of things went on in the mountains because the travel was so restricted that uh, brothers married sisters, so the children became double first cousins, and then a few years later they would marry some of their family, and it just got all tangled up. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, but, but uh, we uh, turned out to be pretty good folks for the most part. Noah Docker, that was my great grandfather, was born in 1847 and he died in 1920. He was the ninth and last child of Thomas Docker, uh, who was my great great grandfather, who lived from 1802 to 1879. Um, Noah, born in 1847 in Cherokee County, North Carolina. Cherokee County is Murphy. Is, uh, the city, the county seat is Murphy. Um, uh, <clears throat> was, was born in Cherokee County and moved with his family to Union County, which is down below Blair, or which is Blairsville, uh, in, eight, um, in 1853 and married his second wife. Now, his first wife is listed in the book here, but uh, it just gives her birth date, marriage date, and her death date, and nothing else. Don't know if she had any children or what, and don't know why, why, uh, why she disappeared. There was no record of why she disappeared or none that we could find. Um, but then he married uh, my, my great grandmother, uh, Janetta Gerard. If you're from around Boston, you've heard that Gerard name. They were roaming the mountains up there too with uh, several other families that eventually came down and settled around Broxton. Um, but Noah and uh, Nitty, as they called her, um, had ten children. And my grandfather, John Robert, um, Johnny they called him, uh, that was his nickname, Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y. And um, being, the sec being the second child in 1877, he was born in 1877. Uh, and 
My name is John James Robert Dockery. And I got that name from this grandfather, John Robert, and my other grandfather, who is Dr. J.J. Lott, his name is John James. So that mom and dad decided me to name me all three of them. And then when we had our son, Belger, Aggie Pat said, we're not having a junior now. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's fine. But, uh, so, um, uh, Nettie, that, that was uh, Noah's wife, she served as a midwife in rural Lumpkin, White, and Union counties. That was a large area, three counties in the mountains. Uh, and she rode a mule all through the mountains to reach families uh, in, uh, in need of her services as a midwife. And she had already, or was in the process of born eight children, I mean, ten children herself. <laughs> but, uh, and then she probably delivered, no telling how many more, you know, through the years. Um, Noah, Noah could neither, this is my great grandfather, Noah could neither read or write, but he accumulated much land. Um, much land with his, with his, in his lifetime. He owned part of Blood Mountain. If you know anything about the, the hills of North Georgia, Blood Mountain is a famous mountain up there. And he owned part of Blood Mountain at one time. There is a Dockery Lake. It's not a big one. Out from uh, out from such as Georgia, uh, and this makes the state map. It's uh, you know, it's nothing like Lake Lanier or, or Lake Sinclair, but it's, uh, it makes the map of the Georgia map. Um, and he owned part of Blood Mountain and other land near Lake Winfield Scott. Has anyone ever been to Vogel State Park or Lake Winfield Scott? Uh, those are that's the crookedest road in the state of Georgia from Vogel to Winfield Scott over there. It's called Wolf Pen Gap Road. And it's nothing but switchback all the way through there. Just if you uh, get car sick or seasick, you better hang on because it's going to be a going to be a rough ride for that is one crooked road. Um, so he he's, he owned part, and all and a lot of land around Suchus in Union County. <laughs> Much of his land is now part of the Chattahoochee National Forest, and he his hard work and business skills enable him to leave 50 acres. 50 acres, a lot of land. 50 acres and a and a cow. Didn't leave a mule. We left a cow. 50 acres and a cow to each of his 10 children. So he had at least 500 acres there. And my dad never owned 500 acres. <laughs> uh, but my great granddad did back in the day. Um, <clears throat> I had one more. Oh, yeah, I got one more story here about uh, Noah's wife, Nettie, as we mentioned a while ago. Uh, she died in 1943. This is the midwife that, that rode the mountains of North Georgia. She died in 1943. Uh, and when they, they found her dead, they went into her bedroom and neatly arranged on, on her bedroom bureau a dresser were her spectacles, an eyedropper, a jar of asphedia. Uh, who knows what asphedia is? Anyone? <laughs> it's a herb. It's, a, it's a, from from the carrot family, and it's a herb that's made from a some some kind of root. And she used that in her doctrine people all in the mountains. Uh, a, 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 a jar of asphedia, a medicine bottle, doesn't say what was in it, sharpening stones, I reckon she maybe had to take a bullet out or two now and then or something, but she had a sharpening stone, gunpowder, and water. I don't know if that was for protection or not, because uh, some of these people, even though they were kin and neighbors, and once in a while they might disagree with each other instead of you know settling it with an old fist fight, they, they pulled out guns and started shooting sometime. And 
Uh, so they found that, and three pieces of tobacco were laid out on that dresser. And uh, a twist, who knows what a twist is, some of you country girls, a twist of tobacco that was used for chewing. And these ladies were ladies, and they were real proper, a lot of them, but they did like their tobacco. Now, they didn't smoke very few. If they smoked, they smoked a pipe. But, uh, but they did like their tobacco. And my, my grandmother, my, my grandmother lived in Broxton across the street from Sue here, from her grandfolks. And uh, she, she, had, she died in 86 or something like that. And she would send me to the store when I was about like this and say, get me a can of Navy snuff. A can of, I said, Navy? I said, How about peace tree or somebody else? I said, no, Navy. She said, Navy in a blue can. He said, and don't tell them who you're getting it for. <laughs> Me, just a six, seven-year-old child. Don't tell them who you get it for. Like, who would I be buying snuff for? <laughs> anyway, these women like their uh, like their tobacco. There was a twist and a plug. And you know, you still buy uh, a red man in the in the leaves today. You can buy a bullet of the woods and a plug. And then she had a, a piece there that had been partially chewed. And I can remember growing up in my bedroom on my bedpost, on my bedpost, it would just had all kind of build up on it. And that's where I had stuck my chewing gum up there at night when I would go to bed and uh, so I could get it in the morning and finish working it out. <laughs> because, but we saved our chewing gum for years and years. And uh, but that's what she did with her, with her, uh, they found that at her death. Um, if you're Johnny, the mic has fallen off. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Let's try to fix it there. Okay, moving right along. Getting a little closer to home. Excuse me here. Baptist preacher here, I got to have a got to wet my whistle. My great my, my grandfather, Johnny, I mentioned him before, and his wife Mary Etta Davis. She was a Davis. Her her parents were her father was a Davis, but her mother was a pickle simer. Well, I don't know if you've heard that name before, Picklesimer. But if you travel in North Georgia, you'll see uh, there used to be a Picklesimer store up there, a country store named Picklesimer. And that was uh, another well-known name in the community. And she would, she and Daddy would always talk about the Picklesimers. And uh, when her, I think when her, when her mother died, uh, Daddy took her up there to the mountains to the funeral, and uh, my oldest brother says he can remember riding up there with her. Him, him and Granny were sitting. He borrowed a car. He didn't have a car to take her that far. He borrowed a car and said they rode in the rumble seat. Him and Grandma rode in the rumble seat up to up to Suches. But. Um, and they lived in such as until, uh, and they had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five children while they were living in such as. Uh, they had Alice from 1897 to 1955. Alice, uh, uh, all these girls, there were 10 girls and two boys. And uh, this. Uh, a fascinating thing about this family, even though they were mountain folks and everything else, uh, grew up on you know, farming and what have you, my granddaddy uh, Johnny was a great believer in education, and he saw to it that every one of these kids got a college education. So out of that, all those children, they all went to college, except, guess who? My daddy. <laughs> he was 
was too busy playing and having a good time. He was working in the railroad shops, hope doing other things. Um, but he didn't get a copy. It was because he, he wasn't offered one or couldn't get one. It's because he just chose not to have one. But uh, Alice married a doctor, and these girls were beautiful. Uh, oh. I remember every one of them, but they were older when I remember. But I've always told how every one of them were just beautiful women. And Sue making uh, allude to that. But they were just beautiful girls, all of them. And they married well. They married well. And uh, one died at birth, but six of the eight girls became school teachers. So there was a lot of teaching going on in that family. Um, Grovia was the next one born in 1900. Uh, she, she married a guy from Elberton who was in the monument business. He was in the, you know, Elberton is the marble and granite capital of Georgia. He was in the monument business. Uh, and then the third child was William Lincoln. Uh, he married a child. He, uh, he married a 16-year-old in Roxburgh, <laughs> uh, who was my mother. And uh, we'll talk a little more about that. But uh, And then uh, Vela, she married an engineer. And he spent a lot of time in Central America. Um, she lived in Athens. And then Margaret was was the child that was, uh, I, guess, I don't know, was she still born or whatever. There, but she died. Uh, she died as a very at, at birth is the only record we have. And then Addie Bell lived in Pennsylvania, Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and her husband was a, a very, very, uh, very successful businessman. And my uncle John Robert, the only other boy in the family, born in 1909. Uh, now he was he was the uh, first one born in. Uh, they moved. They moved from. Uh, they moved from the mountains in. Uh, I believe it was 19, uh, 1908. They moved from the mountains to uh, Morgan County, which is Madison, Georgia, to a little town outside of Madison called Buckhead. Uh, you know the Buckhead in Atlanta it wants to be their own city, but Buckhead was its own city, and it was a very small one. <laughs> so, but uh, but he, he went to grade school there. Um, and then there was, Addie Bell was born in Buckhead. Uh, then John Robert, my, my uncle, he was born in, in uh, Buckhead. Um, and he lived in West Point and was a very successful businessman. Lula May, she was she was born in 1912, and she married a guy from Atlanta who worked at Sears. Uh, anybody remember where the old Sears building was on Ponce de Leon, across from Atlanta Cracker Stadium? Uh, he worked there for years and years. Uh, then my, my Aunt Evelyn, uh, born in 1914, uh, lived in Jacksonville with a very successful insurance man. And uh, I don't know if any of you old enough to go to a South Georgia ball game back in the 20s or whatever, uh, but she played basketball at South Georgia back in the back in the 20s or 30s whenever she was at South Georgia. Then my Aunt Ray married a uh, border patrolman in Tampa, Florida. Uh, he was shore patrol. Uh, and then they had a successful rental business and what have you. Um, I don't have a birth date on her for some reason, but it was after 1914. Then the youngest child, Jewel, was born in 1919, and she married a, a, a chemical engineer and lived in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. He worked for DuPont. So they, I could say they were all educated, but the best thing they did was marry well. So they married well and and uh, and had a good, 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 good life. Um, Back to uh, John Robert. He was married in eight, uh, married in 1896 uh, to Mary uh, Mary 
Edward Davis, and they settled in Suchess and had six children, and then to uh, find better land and get away from the moonshine business. He didn't want his girls, he was having all girls at the time, he didn't want his girls and family to grow up around all that moonshining going on in the mountains. So he, he said, we got to get out of here, and he went down and found better land around Buckhead and moved down there. Um, that was in 1908. My father stayed there uh, and went to school there, and he stayed in the stayed in the uh, sixth grade three years. <laughs> the reason being, I don't know how old he was. Well, he'd have been, he'd have been, uh, he'd have been. Um, Let's see, he had been eight or nine, ten years old, but he, but as time went on, he stayed in sixth grade three years because he had to work cotton year round. Uh, they, because he, like I say, my, my my granddad too must have been his labor force too, but he couldn't go to school for two or three months out of the year because when it came time to prepare the land, then plant the cotton, dust the cotton, and uh, pick the cotton, I mean, it just took the whole near year nearly. So he only went. Uh, soon. Then when he was in the 8th grade, by the time he got to the 8th grade in Buckhead, he was older than the teacher, and he said, it's time for me to quit. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, so he made it through the 8th grade, but, uh, but he uh, decided that school wasn't for him. Uh, then the, the, the bow weevil moved in to Georgia, and it was devastating to the economy of Georgia. And they had no way, they couldn't fight it fast enough with the primitive dust they had and things like that. And so he just, my, grand, my grandfather Johnny just said, we got to get away from this. So he came to South Georgia, <clears throat> was looking, looking for land here in South Georgia. And I don't know what led him to Coffee County or the Broxton area, but uh, he uh, went back to Buckhead and said, I found it, folks. We said, we're moving. So they all moved down here and settled around the Broxton area. And they first, they first lived over there. Brother Johnny mentioned that when, when he saw this album, I mean, this uh, photograph a while ago, he said, you know, I know where that is. I used to ride horses there with the pace boys. And so anyway, they moved over there and lived in that big old clapboard house there on the back side off the Fitzgerald Road. Uh, and then uh, then later on, they, they built a house in Broxton and lived down there across the road with Mr. P.L. Moore, who was a dear friend of my grandfather Luck. But uh, they moved to Coffee County in 1908 and became the first Dockery family to settle in Coffee County. Two of Johnny's brothers, Jim and, and, uh, and George, later joined him here in Coffee County. I'll move on to one to the last generation here and now to my fa father and mother. But let me tell you one more mountain story before we leave the mountains here. Uh, I had a cousin up there. Well, he'd be a, I don't know what removed cousin, but but oh, he was he was kind of a different fellow. Old Bas Bascom uh, Bascom Bascom Bass was his name. I just called him Bass, but uh, he was one arm. And uh, somebody asked him. So said, well, how'd you lose your arm? He said, well, a bunch of buddies and I were going to prayer meeting. And uh, I was, uh, after the service, I was sitting on a rail fence out there waiting on them to catch up with me. And old, old what was the guy, Bill somebody came along, Bill Reeves or somebody came along and said, what you doing? Sitting on, he said, "What you doing, sitting on that fence?" He said, "It ain't none of your business." <laughs> so that, that led to a fight. <laughs> so and it ended up not being a fist fight, but a gun fight. So they all carried guns up there, being in the moonshine business and what have you. And the story goes that the old uh, Reeves guy had already had five or six notches in his gun, so he was a dangerous fellow. But anyway, in the scuffle there, Bass got his. Uh, got shot through the shoulder there and it, it just shattered the bone so he lost his arm and uh, but still that, that was some 30 he lived 30 something years after that but he was a bear trapper 
he would trap bears for meat and he said he'd rather have bear steak any time than beef steak it was so much better he said and lard he said you could get five gallons of lard out of one big bear he said way more than a hog would make <laughs> so, and you, then they use that lard all year for cooking and uh, so but he was quite a fellow and there were a lot of characters up there like him but um, as I said, my father came down here in 19, uh, what did we say, 19, no, 1918? I can't remember now. Let me flip back over here when they moved from Buckhead. Yeah, it was 1918. And uh, they... Uh, but they had one, one, the youngest girl was born here in Broxton. Jewel was born here in Broxton. But mother and dad settled up on what we call the river, up there beyond prison. You go to the river road, up the river road, just keep going. You'll finally come to 107 up there and you take a right and you'll come to a place called Rocky Creek area over there. They settled up around Rocky Creek near the rocks. Uh, the rocks, you're an uh, expert on the rocks, Dr. Cottingham and Rocky Creek uh, gets its name from the rocks and they settled up there and there was a, you didn't mention this the other day but there was a schoolhouse up there, Rocky Creek School uh, none of my family ever went to it but I know some people that did, it was a one room schoolhouse and 10 or 12 kids went there back in the day and uh, but anyway they settled up, settled up there and uh, they uh, but before then, they, they they courted. My dad had a motorcycle back in the 20s. He had a motorcycle. And uh, he loved to show off and this, that, and the other. And my, my mother, being 15 or 16 at the time, she rode a horse everywhere. <clears throat> and it was her job. My dad, my grandfather was an old country doctor. And he uh, he would go see patients all around the Broxton area, West Green, uh, even go over toward Ambrose, but he would he would service all that area, all up on the river, and uh, he was quite a character himself. And there's a there is a uh, another story for another time. There's a whole genealogy on the the lots of wiregrass, but that'll be for someone else. If I don't know as much history about the the lots as I do the doctors, but anyway, it was her job to ride out in the country and bring home his paycheck which could be a, several chickens, it could be a hog or two, it could be a cow, goat, whatever. It was her job to drive them home on a horse or bring them home with her horse. And uh, Daddy told one of his buddies one day in town, he said, you see that gal on that horse? He said, yeah, she's a pretty thing, isn't she? He said, yeah. He said, I'm gonna marry that girl. <laughs> and one day he did. But when he went to get her, he took his gun with him. <laughs> but granddaddy didn't think much of him. Uh, he, he took his gun with him, and they took off, headed toward Waycross, because my dad was working in the railroad yard down there. And they stopped long enough in Nichols to get married. And them being hard shell Baptists all their life, they stopped at the Methodist Church and found the preacher there, and he married them on the front lawn of the Methodist Church in Nichols. And then they uh, went on and settled in uh, settled in Waycross. And finally they got up enough courage to say, well, what do you think about going back home? And Dad said, well, we better check with your daddy before we just show up. <laughs> he, he said, uh, you know, he, cause he, was, he didn't know what granddaddy would do because he was, uh, was kind of unpredictable. <laughs> but, uh, so they got <clears throat> called Sue, Sue, Sue Harper here to granddad, Mr. P.L. Moore, and asked him to go talk to granddaddy and uh, see if he would allow them to come back. And he told them, yeah, y'all come on back. So they came back, and then that's why they settled on one of my granddaddy's farms up around Rocky Creek. And then they later moved down to Pridge. And my mother was 16 when they got married. They got married on June 21st, 1924. 
And uh, I guess they needed labor and leading it in a hurry for them because they started having young. <laughs> so, in 25, my brother was born, the oldest brother. And uh, he, he, uh, he was quite influential in my life, as my other brothers and sisters were. And uh, to, to skip time here, I was born in 47. So my older brother was 22 years older than I. So I had, I had three brothers and sisters in college when I was born. And one was already married or about to be married. And um, I tell, you know what I tell people, I started the day back when I was five. <clears throat> I went and stayed with my sister Faith. Stayed with her in the girls' dorm. And she let me go stay with some of the, her, her boyfriends over in the men's dorm. And then I started at Georgia, University of Georgia, when I was about seven. I'd go up there and stay with my brother in the summer. He was, he'd already been to World War II, come back, and gone back to school. And was living in married housing up there near the Coliseum. Uh, they're still there, but it was married housing back then. And I'd, I'd be with him. And the way I'd get around to all these older brothers and sisters, I'd travel by bus. And most time it was trailways. Once in a while you could catch a Greyhound, but most of Greyhound was usually express. They didn't stop much. But um, we never used came to the bus station either. Mama would take me out there to the end of the road, and my brother taught her to hang a tag on my neck to say where I was going. It would read where I was going, you know, drop off in such and such addresses, that and the other. <clears throat> but uh, she'd flag that bus down, that trailway bus coming down the hill. She'd flag it down. And I'd get on that thing and I'd go to Winder, Georgia, to Augusta, to Athens, just all around Americas, and, um, and just travel that way. One time I went to see Faye in Pennsylvania. I got a good ride up there. Took the train. She took me over there to Thalman. You know where Thalman is? Uh, go past. <laughs> go 32 and just keep going. You'll finally come to uh, Thalman, Georgia. And uh, caught the train there. But being the good mother she is, you know, we couldn't ever leave home. Don't ever leave home hungry. She had a brown sack <laughs> full of fried chicken. <laughs> fried chicken and other things in there. A biscuit or two and what have you. But I I got on the train, and that was about a 14-hour ride, I think, 12 or 14-hour ride up to Wilmington, Delaware. And I rode that train all night, and that sack was empty when I got there. <laughs> but you, that's how I visited Faye was on the train. And uh, I remember taking, taking Aggie after we were married to New York City, New York City. <laughs> and uh, we were coming back. I said, you want to talk to your mom on that train running 70 miles an hour? I said, you want to talk to your mom? She said, how? I said, there's a phone right there. I said, call her. I said, how? You can't call her. I said, yes, you can. Just pick the phone up and tell them the number you want. So she picked the phone up and called home. I said, how am I, can I call and talk to my mama and this train moving? I said, well, they... I said that wires had a hard time keeping up with us, but, it's, but uh, that was her first experience on an electric train. And so, anyway, let me get on down to my brother. I told you about my sister Betty. Taught school for 50 years. She married a he was a he was an antique guy. She, yeah, and bought used equipment. Ross Myers. Then we come down to Carl Bodocker. He he was one of the few that came back to Douglas and settled here, and was a successful veterinarian. and his wife Mert was a school teacher and a lunchroom coordinator for years and years. And then my sister Bobby, she had aspirations of being a missionary in China and she had a Chinese roommate at Mercer. But uh, she had uh, rheumatoid arthritis so bad that she had to give up that dream and she became a housewife and apparently spent a lot of time at home because she had seven kids. <laughs> uh, she had seven kids kids and they all turned out well. Then Faye, she was the, she was our world traveler. She's been she's been everywhere. You heard that song, everywhere, <laughs> man everywhere. But she's been all over the nation doing different things and mainly in organ procurement and things like that. But she's lived New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Texas, New Mexico, Alaska. She spent two she's gonna go to Alaska for six weeks, I mean six months and she stayed two years. So we and we were fortunate enough to go. This is how I got to see the country. I went and visited my brothers and sisters. They were already at points of interest.
pastor out there. And my brother took me all over the country, oldest brother. And then I come down my sister Cheryl, who was a tobacco queen years ago here in uh, Douglas. And uh, she was a, a nurse, and she loved the ER. She liked that, and, and I call it the graveyard shift. She liked that, she liked that, uh, that, that, that trauma in the emergency room, that excited her. And she, she liked that kind of work. So, and then it come down to me, I'm the baby. John James Robert. <clears throat> and Faith tells me that I was the only one that was ever planned. They didn't want Cheryl to grow up by herself, uh, so they planned to have me. And my daddy was <clears throat> 40 something, and my mother was in her late 30s when I was born. But, um, Uh, many, many other stories I could tell you about the Dockery family. My dad was, uh, before he married my mama at gunpoint, <laughs> he, he uh, tried his luck at hoboing. He and his buddy, they jumped trains and they would go, went to West Texas and worked in the wheat fields. Uh, came back and worked in the coal mines in Kentucky. The foreman said, we need some blasters, we need some blasters. And anybody out here in this group know about blasting? And he hollered, yeah, we do, we do. He never seen a coal mine before, never, but they needed the job, they needed some money. So they went in there and they told some other folks, they said, y'all got to show us how to do here, show us what to do. So they, they showed them how to set a charge and how to do a little blasting in the coal mine. And then as I said, he worked at a railroad shop and uh, he, uh, he, he did a, a lot of like, motorcycles and what have you. And, um, and I said, my, my mother, she, she rode that horse and brought home the p p pavement from country folk. And my granddaddy Law was a very stern fellow. He caught her smoking. He caught her smoking in the eight, uh, eighth grade, I think it was. <clears throat> and her punishment was, but not a whipping or not a scolding or, or not, a, not a time out. He held her out of school for a whole year, would not let her go to school for a year. So when she got to the 10th grade, got through it, she finally quit. <laughs> but they believed in education so much that they made sure that all seven of their children went to college. Uh, I mentioned some time back about a hanging dog, and if you wonder where that name comes from, <clears throat> It can, the story is you see the hanging the, the Indian in the canoe with his dog. Uh, this is the hang this is the hanging dog annual update. It's got more genealogy and pictures and things like that. Uh, more news. It's the annual news newsletter. And uh, but this Indian was going down hanging dog going down this creek up there going down a the creek Cherokee Indian. And uh, he came to a place in the creek, and there was these old grapevines, bullish vines, a wild grape just hanging all down on, on the river there. And he uh, ducked down and went through there and, and made it through with his canoe and everything. Then he made it on down to his landing, and he looked back to call his dog out, and his dog was gone. He said, oh, Lord. So he ran back upstream and went, just went upstream and he found out where it came to the place where the vines were hanging down. And there was his dog hanging in the vine. And he yelled, yelled everybody around and said, hanging dog, hanging dog. <laughs> and they all, they all came running and he, uh, he got the dog down, and which, which served him for many more years after that. But that's how hanging dog got its name, it was from that Cherokee Indian hanging his dog in the vine. <laughs> And there's Hanging Dog Community up there and Hanging Dog Baptist Church. And if you want to see some dead doctors, you go to Hanging Dog Cemetery. <laughs> Lord, they are everywhere. That's a big cemetery. Uh, just covers the whole hillside. My great-grandfather's buried there and there's all the list of his children on his tombstone. But just doctors everywhere. So that was their stronghold there. And then there's a lot of them elsewhere in North Carolina, you know, in North Georgia. <clears throat> but I mentioned old Bass Dockery. There he is uh, in, in typical mountain dress with his boots on and, and uh, mountain gear. And then just to show we do have a little we, did, we do have a little 
bit of fame in our in our life. Here we see a may be hard for you to see, but that's Lieutenant Audie L. Murphy. They traced his roots back to the doctors. So uh, I'm related to the most decorated soldier of World War II, <laughs> Audie Murphy. So this magazine was, was published each, each, uh, each year. We'll wrap it up right here. Uh, this is a story my oldest brother wrote. He said, uh, my oldest brother, William L. Dockery, Billy, he was called. And it's the story of my life, and it's kind of like my presentation here today. It's got no particular order, <laughs> no, no, no chapters, no page numbers. He just sat down at the computer and found it and found it and found it, what came to his mind. And he, he did get a little titles here ever so often, but you can't, you can't tell anybody on what page it is or this, that, and the other because there's no page number. It just reads, well, he didn't even have a table of contents. He just said, my life. And he comes over here and says, uh, our farm and just different, different talk. World War II. Uh, he was a decorated soldier in World War II. But uh, one interesting story that he had here, he had a fantastic memory. He can remember, remember from the time he was just a child. He said he can remember things when he was three and four years old. And uh, sometime I couldn't remember yesterday. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he uh, tells the story of uh, it was the Miller guy up on, up on, uh, up on above a prison up toward the river. They went off, two brothers, they went off and uh, got to drinking one Sunday afternoon. And you know what drinking leads to? It leads to fighting. And the first thing you know, they, they, there's two brothers now. He's killed. He's, he's cut up and shot and what have you. He said, he writes in here about his daddy taking him up there to see uh, Miller. Back then, they get two saw horses and a couple of three boards and lay you out on the front porch. And he had a sheet over it. He said, Daddy took me over to him and threw that sheet back. And he said, that's the first dead person I'd ever seen. <laughs> him four years old. And uh, he said, I could see where he was all cut up and he had one bullet hole in him. And uh, he said, he said they did sentence his brother to a prison term. Uh, so he did, he did serve time for killing his brother. But that was just natural for folks to be fighting back in the day. Um, that one of them, I'll mention these photographs down here. This is I showed you a while ago. This is where my dad was born in Sutchis, Georgia, in 1902, and he had a couple of sisters born two or three years before him. This is the home place in Broxton where I grew up across from Reed Branch Church. Faye, you were born over there on the back side, weren't you, Aunt? I think I was born in Pridgen. I'm not ever... Okay, there was about three or four of them born in Pridgen, and uh, Billy was born uh, up in the creek. But this is, that's a photo taken in about 19, I'm saying 50, 50 to 55, somewhere in there. And you'll see here a, a grape vineyard. And that whole field used to be grapes. And all we cut those grapes, and we get washed on, and we'd go to the road and try to sell them, and you'd bring them back, and I'd pull them out. And we had everything but a winery. You just can't make money with grapes unless you got a winery or a jelly factory. So we didn't have either. But my mother, she was a teetotaler. She did not like drinking. But she had to have a little wine for her fruitcake, and she would make about four gallons of wine every year. Now, I don't believe she cooked that many fruitcakes, but, but that wine would be gone every year. It would be gone every year in time to make more. But that was, and you'll see some tenant houses down here. Uh, there's a tenant house back here, and there's one over here, the one in the field that got a tornado took it away. There was about five tenant houses on that farm at one time. 
and Mr. Wilkerson recalls in his younger day, days going out there, the, my dad went across the river and moved three families. They were all in the same family, Pace family. The father and two sons and their families over down to our farm. And he recalled going out and, and uh, riding horses and playing with those And Deacon Pace was a well-respected uh, fellow in the Broxton community and elsewhere. He was very active in the NAACP and very active in his church. And in fact, Daddy thought so much of him and loved him so much that he uh, gave him some land before he ever gave a child any. He gave uh, Deacon Pace, as we call him, um, 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 a lot to build. It. So he pick it out anywhere on the farm you want. And uh, he picked the place over there on the Fitzgerald Road to build his house and rear his family. So uh, that's uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think about anything else that, that, that you might relate to. But uh, our place was always just, we had a big front yard. It was a natural football field, baseball field. We just had children out there all the time. And uh, that was on weekends. This time we were working. We, we grew tobacco, cotton, corn, peanuts. Uh, we grew it all, cows, hogs. So we were always working. You know, but we all but we all got a good education and we loved each other and got along well and when we divided the estate the seven of us sat down uh, and we never had the first cross word and settled the estate so um, everything worked out well and that's how the doctor has got to call for county my, my, my granddaddy being the first one to come and send word back to the mountains thank you <laughs> Jimmy, I always feel the good story. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see y'all next month. Thank you very much.